Violence is a natural topic for anyone interested in human nature because you look at human history, you look at current events, you can't help but thinking, how could people do these things? What is it about human nature that allows us to uh, do so much killing and maiming and raping and torturing? Uh, on the other hand, that may not be the, the best question. The best question might be, what is it about human nature that allows us to refrain from all of these things that many organisms do, like killing their rivals or preying on uh, weaker organisms? What is it about the human mind that uh, has allowed us to live in greater peace and cooperation? And I don't think it's too uh, crazy to think that this has something to do with what makes language special namely the ability of the mind to uh, come up with new ideas based on uh, deductions from old ideas. And I think among the ideas that our species has hit upon in exercising this component of human nature, reasoning and, uh, and rationality, uh, are ideas for how we can make ourselves better off by fighting less, how uh, one party can lay down its arms in the expectation that the other party is doing it at the same time. I grew up in Quebec, uh, bi bilingual society. I uh, was sent to Hebrew lessons by my, by my parents in preparation for my bar mitzvah and went to Hebrew camp. I took Spanish in high school, so I really should be quadrilingual. And, uh, I'm not as fluent as I, uh, as I really ought to be, uh, and it's especially embarrassing for some, someone who studies language for a living. I think one of the most amazing phenomena yeah, of the human species is the child's ability to learn a language. They, they don't get uh, lessons, and, which is a good thing, because then they would speak as badly as I speak my <laughs> second language, but uh, you, know, you go to France and all these kids speak such good French, <laughs> and you go to England and they speak British English with such a charming accent. Uh, but even the language that they pick up here, which we take for granted, uh, you have a three-year-old and they're talking a blue streak in almost completely grammatical English without the benefit of lessons or feedback or homework. Uh, how do they do it? Well, uh, the rare cases in which kids do make errors can be very informative. And I spent a big chunk of my career trying to understand why kids say things like, we holded the baby rabbits, or he, uh, he, he break the glass or uh, he teared it and then I sticked it to the uh, painting. These aren't forms that they've copied from their parents because parents don't say sticked and teared, but they show the child's mind is actively at work chopping streams of language into their components. Uh, they never hear ED in isolation. They just hear walked and played and swallowed and so on. Somehow their mind is able to snip the suffix off the end of these verbs and then it's available to be then glued onto other verbs like stick and, and uh, tear. So I think this is an early uh, example of the, this powerful mental engine behind language of combining parts of words according to rules. It, it just pops out in their speech because it deviates from the way we adults do it. So many aspects of, of language are windows into features of human nature. Uh, the way we use verbs, for example, uh, reveals our mental model of how the world works. The fact that we can say uh, he dimmed the light if he flicked the switch, but not he dimmed the light if he turned on the toaster and the light dimmed as a result. That ties into our mental concept of causation. Whenever we use uh, a tense, past, present, or future, it shows the peculiar way in which the human mind chops up the timeline into three segments. Uh, when we use innuendo and euphemism, like, would you like to come up and see my etchings, it shows something about how touchy we are about our social relationships. And even taboo language, swearing, uh, racial epithets, says something about the emotional part of our brains. Uh, th that is, why is there such a difference between one of the four-letter words that I uh, have been told that I can't say in this interview, but you all know what they are, and their genteel synonyms? Uh, given they mean the same thing, uh, given that the sounds themselves are, uh, are just sounds, given that you can substitute an asterisk or a dash for one of the letters, and then all of a sudden the New York Times can print it, then it's okay. 
What's going on? What emotional button are these words pressing? And why should they press them? And what does that say about human emotional responses? I was never a much of a radical. Uh, I was influenced by a friend who convinced me that I ought to be an anarchist, that the police were not necessary to, uh, because in the absence of property and laws, humans are spontaneously cooperative and they would just see how illogical it would be to exploit someone else and that the police were actually a cause of violence. Uh, and that sounded all very plausible to me until 1969 when uh, the Montreal police went on strike. Uh, in Quebec, everyone goes on strike. It's kind of like France in that regard. Well, one day it was the police's turn. And within a few hours, there were riots and looting and two murders uh, until the Mounties were called in to restore order. And that pretty much put the kibosh on my, my career as an anarchist. As someone who believes that language is a product of human nature, I don't share all of the gloom about the decline of language. The idea that uh, you know, Twitter and instant messaging are going to have us speaking in little uh, sound bites, I don't think language works that way. Uh, I think that we do sometimes lose uh, distinctions that it would be nice to preserve. Disinterested to mean impartial as opposed to bored, for example. On the other hand, uh, we are always replenishing the supply of meaning and beauty in language, and that's why I don't think language will ever deteriorate, even though inevitably it will change. Mm -hmm.